Hey, welcome to this lesson. Um, it is for the Parsha Noah, and uh, of course it's the Haftarah, and it covers Isaiah 54, verse 1, all the way through 55, verse 5. And I got to tell you, um, this portion absolutely blew me away. So here's the first mind blower. Isaiah is speaking of a time that's far, far into the future. And I think I mentioned that to you in, in one of the earlier lessons. But I think it's something that we really need to keep in our minds, um, is that contemporarily speaking, Isaiah's original audience of the Southern Kingdom, well, they're living in relative prosperity and security while Isaiah is prophesying. He speaks um, kind of, of a long forward future. And he speaks to the time of the Babylonian captivity, which for his original audience hasn't happened yet. But the thing that blew me away is that he's not speaking a warning of impending doom and gloom. He's stating a fact that they would have already known from the book of Deuteronomy of a future exile and destruction of Jerusalem. He's stating it as it's the fact, but that's not the point. His point is to offer consolation and hope. And that's consolation and hope about the final redemption and the return of all the exiles. Now, that, of course, would be the northern kingdom that have already been exiled by the Assyrians, but also the future, to his audience, the future exile of the southern kingdom. And, of course, he's the prophet to the southern kingdom, right? And he's speaking about this before they're exiled. He's offering hope. Hope for a future glory of the messianic kingdom, an era under a Davidic king, Messiah. Now I want you to let that sink in. Destruction and exile will happen. There is a desolate future. That's a given. But it's the guaranteed future redemption that's his point and the point that he wants us to take. He's giving them, and you, and I, something to hold on to when any destruction comes, for when any exile comes, for when you feel like the abandoned wife that Isaiah likens Israel and Jerusalem to. Now, whether that destruction comes in your lifetime or the lifetime of your children or your grandchildren, you can know, because of Isaiah's words, with a certainty that God promises full redemption. And our job is to trust that he makes good on his future promises. Now, what future parent-to-be hasn't worried about the kind of world that they're leaving behind for their unborn children? And what parent hasn't sat up many, many nights crying with worry over how things are going in the world right now, knowing that it's going to get worse for our children? Any person who has any sphere of influence thinking about the world and how things are going to get darker um, has that same kind of worry, whether you're a parent or not. It's into every generation that Isaiah speaks. He says there will be a redemption. Jerusalem, that connecting point, that physical land connecting point between God and man, that will be rebuilt. And this is promised before it's been destroyed mind-blowing. Return of the exiles is promised before the exile. Your future, says Isaiah, because God's telling him this, is secure. It's set. 
before you ever face any difficulties and personal exiles. God's people, that's us, we will flourish, as Isaiah says. The barren woman that he talks about will have more children following God's ways than the sons of the married wife. Now, it's interesting that Isaiah uses the analogy of a husband and a wife to describe what Israel as a people and individually feel when they're exiled. Now, remember, exile of the people from the land is a living parable of someone not having God in their life. Not that he's not there, but maybe they've turned from him. When we turn away from God, when we forget him in our busy lives, we experience an anguish of the soul, right? That's an exile of spiritual quality. If you've ever felt, felt abandoned by God, then you understand well why Isaiah used the analogy of the barren and put away shamed wife. And the other thing that blew me away is that Isaiah isn't saying that God as the husband abandoned Israel, the wife. He's saying that this is how it feels to experience exile or distance from God. When he talks about God who's angry for a moment, that's from the perspective of how it feels to us to be distanced from God. It's a horrible, horrible feeling. It's into that that Isaiah speaks of this sweet consolation that God gives his people. The exile will end. Isaiah 54, 4 through 6. Let me read this. It says, Do not fear, for you shall not be put to shame, nor hurt. You shall not be humiliated. For the shame of your youth you shall forget, and not remember the reproach of your widowhood any more. For your husband, for your maker is your husband. Yahweh of hosts is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. He is called the Elohim of all the earth. Isaiah reminds us of hope. Um, the generations that have had a, have seen the Babylonian destruction and, and dispersion, the generations that have been waiting and waiting for the return of the Davidic king, it's into these generations that he speaks this hope. And we see glimpses of the rebuilding of his kingdom, don't we? If, if we have eyes to see the return of the Jews to the land, the emergence of the love of Torah among non-Jews. You and I are part of this prophecy of rebuilding. Did you know that God wants to rebuild you? He wants to rebuild those waste places. You have waste places in your life, right? I know I do. Maybe you feel like the barren woman forsaken. And Isaiah tells us in verse 7, For a little while I have forsaken you, but with great compassion I shall gather you. In an overflow of wrath I hid my face from you for a moment, but with everlasting loving commitment I shall have compassion on you, says Yahweh, your Redeemer. We can take heart in knowing that God wants to help us to build back those waste places, those places of shame, um, the feelings of abandonment. He wants to give us our dignity back as his daughter, as his bride, the one who's not forsaken. He wants to build back the original image, that original image of God, that he created in you. And you can, with God's help, rebuild those waste places in yourself, those wounded places, 
Maybe they came from childhood. Maybe they continued as you were growing up. And you can rebuild this, these places by assessing that place in yourself that was never wounded in the first place. Did you know that there's a place in each of us that was never wounded? That's the place of our divine soul, that spark of God that's in each one of us. It's mind-blowing to me to think that we each have a part of us that's unwounded. I happen to believe this is the place of connection with God, this God that Isaiah speaks of, the one who is full of compassion. And I believe that we can pray and we can bring that presence into our daily interactions with ourselves and with others. Who is like our God? The main connection of this Haftarah to the Torah, por- Torah portion Noach is, of course, that verse in 54, chapter 54, verse 9. And that says, <clears throat> For this is the waters of Noah to me, in that I have sworn that the waters of Noah would never again cover the earth, so I have sworn not to be wroth with you, nor to rebuke you. So here's the connection. <clears throat> God made an oath after the flood, never again to destroy the earth with a flood. And so too, when Mashiach comes, when Messiah comes, God will never turn away from Israel again, leaving Israel at the hands of her enemies. Now, I'm excited to share a midrash that I learned from the sages um, about why God found it necessary to make this promise to Noah in the first place. Now, a midrash is a teaching based on scripture. You won't find this in the scripture, okay? But as we all do, we we uh, come up with, with stories to kind of help wrap our mind around the awesomeness of God. And so that's what this this midrash is about. So the mid midrash questions why Noah had to be told to leave the ark. So in the midrash, he has Noah has to be told. He doesn't just go willingly. Um, it says that God actually had to command him to leave. And so the question then becomes, why would Noah delay? I mean, if you think about it, it was probably very loud and noisy and stinky and uh, tight quarters and fearful in the ark. Why wouldn't he want to go out immediately? Well, the Midrash describes this mindset of Noah that would have kind of prevented him from wanting to leave. And I think this can like have some practical applications for you and me. So that's kind of why I'm sharing it. So the Midrash goes that um, Noah says, well, if I go out from the ark, I'll have children and then I'll rebuild society. But what's the point of it all? Because there's no guarantee that they're going to do any better than their ancestors. And then their world will be destroyed as well. And all my efforts will be for nothing. Well, I think that's kind of an understandable thing to think, right? And that kind of thinking, I think, kind of goes along with what I was saying earlier in this video, how we worry about the current young generation and about the upcoming generations. Um, We worry is, you know, if I pour and pour and pour into my child or I pour and pour into someone I'm mentoring, uh, is is it going to be worth it, right? So how does God answer this very human reaction of Noah in the Midrash? Well, he doesn't dismiss what Noah is saying as being meaningless. He says that he swears that there will never be another flood. And what does he tell uh, Isaiah in this Haftarah? He says that during the times of Messiah, he will no longer turn his face from his people. So what's going on? Well, God is reassuring you and I through the prophet Isaiah, that we don't have to be afraid of rebuilding out of fear that everything will come crumbling down again. 
You don't have to be afraid to pour into the lives of your children, your grandchildren, the lives of those in your sphere of influence, those you're mentoring, your loved ones, family members, neighbors. No matter what it might seem like today, or no matter what it might seem like it's going to be tomorrow, we can trust the story, right? We have a trustworthy story ending because we have a trustworthy story maker who is like our God. Thank you.